Mark chapter 2. And because I know all of you brought your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn there to Mark chapter 2. Waiting to hear the shuffling of pages at that point. There's a Bible in the pew in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to take that. That's yours. And we'll replace it. But we want you to have a copy of the Word. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12 in the second chapter of Mark, chapter 2. And when he had come back to the region of Capernaum, several days after it was heard that he was at home, many were gathered at the home, and they gathered together so that there was no longer room even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing him a paralytic. Carrying him. Four men. And being unable. Now listen to this. Being unable to get him. Because of the crowd. They moved to the roof. Don't miss that. Above him. And when they had dug an opening. When they had dug an opening. They lowered him down on the pallet. Which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus seeing their faith. Said to the paralytic. My son. Your sins are forgiven. But there were some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive the sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus aware in his spirit that they were reasoning in that manner within them said to them why are you reasoning about these things in your heart which is easier to say to the paralytic your sons are for your sins are forgiven or to say to him arise take up your pallet and walk but in order that you might theory on earth to forgive sins he said to the paralytic I say to you rise up take your pallet and go home and he rose up and immediately took his pallet and went out in amaze and went out in the sight of all so that they were all amazed and they were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. We have never seen anything like this. We gather. Join me. Um, Steve, I want to share something with you. You are the only person I know in life that has their own Wikipedia page. <laughs> I was going to share Steve's kind of bio. We know Steve as just Steve Yarborough. Steve's past, the way he has served God, our state, and our community is beyond measure. And I asked Steve if he would come and literally just put a book in to our series on 2020 vision. And I hope you've come today prepared to be blessed. I, I could spend an entire hour talking about and giving accolades. Steve, I want you to know that Mona and I, years and years and years ago, looked at you and Linda, and if there was ever a family that we wanted to emulate, to say this is the family, and these are the people we want to allow our children to see, that was you and Linda. So thank you. We appreciate you, and we love you. 
God's grace on you. Well, good morning, church. <laughs> I told Mitch that I was willing to do this, but I was hoping you wouldn't call my bluff. <laughs> I need to remind everyone of the obvious. I am not a preacher. I want to lower expectations as much as I possibly can. Let's see. I've taught fifth and sixth grade boys in vacation Bible school and uh, high schoolers for a bunch of years and then adults in Sunday school for about 20 years. But Sunday morning in the pulpit is different. Lord help me. <laughs> I want to introduce one person. Our pastor who married us 51 years ago. Denny Parsons. Stand up, if you can. <laughs> I've tried a couple of hundred cases to a conclusion during my uh, 50 years practicing law and gave my uh, share of speeches on the floor of the Arizona House and the Arizona Senate during my 16 years there. But despite those experiences, I've never felt called to be a preacher. Just blessed with some opportunities to talk about Jesus. And that's what I hope to do today, focus a bit on Jesus and talk about some people who knew they needed him. Now, as a result of teaching the Bible verse by verse over these years, there are some events during Jesus' ministry that stand out in my mind, and I love talking about those, and they could include the healing of the man with leprosy, who Jerry talked and preached about so very well his last year here. Then there's the calming of the storm, which many of us can identify with, that, Lord, Lord, don't you care? that desperate do something cry of his followers something that we could all probably identify with some then there's the encounter with the off married woman how did he know her history and then the challenge for those without sin to cast the first stone walking on water oh peter Keep your eyes on me, buddy. Good counsel for all of us. And then there's the feeding of the 5,000 with a few fishes and loaves. How did he do that? Then there's the woman breaking open and pouring the perfume on Jesus' feet. And my, how I love Steve Green's wonderful song about that event. The Lord's Supper. I love how we sing the Lord's Prayer on those Sundays. Never seen any other church do that. Then there's the encounter of the two fellows on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. And as I think about it, so many more. God's word is just so amazing. And I love the gospel accounts because every one of them helps us come closer to Jesus. Well, because I got to choose my subject today, I chose one of my real favorites for our text, and it's Mark's account of Jesus' healing the paralytic found in Mark 2, 1 through 12. Thank you uh, for that, Mitch. I was afraid you were going to start preaching. <laughs> Wouldn't have left anything for me to say. When Michael W. Smith was here in concert recently in Chandler, he used these verses, made me smile. He loves them too. Well, this event occurs fairly early in Jesus' ministry, but not before he had started to create quite a stir in that region. By the time this event occurs, Jesus had driven out evil spirits, healed many folks with diseases, including the man with leprosy that Jerry preached about, and had called several of his disciples to follow me. 
At this point in time, Jesus had moved his home base from Nazareth to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a small town on the coast of the Sea of Galilee, and it was where Peter and his wife's family resided. At that time, Capernaum had a population of about 1,500 folks. It was where, obviously, Peter and his wife's family lived, and he had left his growing up hometown of Nazareth, which only had about 400 folks, to relocate to Capernaum. And Jesus returned there, and the scripture notes in Mark 2, verse 1, and I quote, he had come home. Jesus went to the house, probably the house of Peter's wife's family, but we don't know that for sure. Crowds were following him even when he was out in the countryside. Mark 1.45 says that he could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet people still came to him from everywhere. He was becoming a high-profile public figure without a Facebook page or a Twitter account. Mark 2.2 says, so many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So picture this in your mind. The house was packed. Folks were at the door and the windows, and apparently they were even lined up outside trying to hear. We also learned that there were some religious leaders, likely from some very exclusive and prestigious groups, the elite of the day. And they were already looking for a reason to oppose or even harm Jesus. They would have had the very best seats in the house right in front of Jesus. And it was going to be a day that they would not forget. Now I will confess I have been blessed to have the best seats in the house more than most folks. When President Trump visited at Gateway Airport, I was seated right there behind him. 1976, I met President Reagan before he was president when he spoke at Scottsdale Christian Academy fundraiser. Linda was a teacher there, and I would still say he was probably the best public speaker I ever heard. Twice I've been seated behind the governor on the podium as the Senate president when he gave his State of the State address. I was in the front row once at Mesa Community College when President George W. Bush came there. We shook hands and visited for a little bit. Linda and I were in Ed Robeson's home and met Vice President Pence and ex or former Vice President Quayle. And last October, we met with President Bush when he came to Chandler on behalf of Valley Christian High School. Presidents, vice presidents, senators, members of Congress, governors, ambassadors, Hall of Fame baseball and football players, race car champions, and titans of business. I've met those folks, but the most important person I've ever met was Jesus. Amen. Even our football seats are in the front row. Go figure. Well, when Linda was a little girl, about six years old, she and her family were standing in the front on a street corner in downtown Denver as the president's motorcade approached. Suddenly it stopped. President Eisenhower popped out of his car, went up to her, and shook her hand. She was just that cute. <laughs> so it's good to be in the front sometimes. But on this day, the religious leaders in the front row were in for quite a surprise. Now the story gets interesting right away. Mark 2, 3 through 5 says, Some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
Oh my. As we will see, those would be fighting words, ultimately words sufficient to justify murder for some of the folks in that crowd. The word here was plural. He was referring to the faith of the paralyzed man and his four friends. Now, houses in the first century in this location normally had flat roofs. They had planks that they ran across there, and then they put fronds on top, and then mud to try to make the roof more or less waterproof. Typically, stairs were built outside leading up to the roof, and the people would often go up and sit there, sort of the patio of their day. Think of Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof. Grass would even grow on the roof because of the mud filler. So, stymied by the crowd, they carried their friend on his mat to the roof with a rope tied to each corner. Now, in a town the size of Capernaum, the paralytic man would have been well known to almost everyone there. Little doubt could exist about the reality of his paralysis. Now, most of the folks in that crowd believed his paralysis was the result of sin in his life, or even his parents' lives. But often, or even, well, let me say it this way. Sometimes our diseases, our illnesses, are the result of sin in our lives, but Normally, most often, they are the result of being human and having the curse of Adam applicable to all mankind. So these four fellows who, were, who had very likely been paying attention to what Jesus had been saying and doing, they brought him to Jesus in hopes that he, Jesus, would heal him. They had faith. And they believed that he could do this. They carried their friend to the king. Hold on to that thought. They carried their friend to the king. They climbed the stairs and then dug through the roof. They knew that they were going to be responsible for the cost of the repairs. <laughs> but they would not be deterred. They lowered their friend down, which would have required a pretty substantial hole in the roof. Imagine the hullabaloo. I doubt that the effort was universally well received. Jesus was interrupted. The elite folks in the front row were likely the recipients of plenty of falling dirt. Certainly this was below their station in life. And then Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Now think about it. That was not what the paralytic and his friends expected to hear. Honestly, probably not what they actually hoped to hear. They were looking to hear something like, you are healed like others that they had heard about or perhaps even seen. Mark 2, 6 through 7 then says, Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now please, understand. These were smart guys. Their theology was correct. Only God can forgive sins. I get it. No pastor, no priest, no church leader, no man can forgive sins. The teachers of the law surely wondered how in the world could this carpenter's son from Nazareth, who was not formally educated like they were, say such a thing. That's terrible. Blasphemy. And the penalty for blasphemy is death. Mark 2, 8 through 9 then says, Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking 
these things. Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. And don't forget, Jesus had just proved that he could read the minds of the teachers of the law sitting there in front of him, and he knows our thoughts afar off. Okay. Which is easier to say? Well... It's easier to say your sins are forgiven because that fact is not instantly subject to physical proof. Now get up, take your mat, and walk can't be faked. At least not this fellow in this crowd in this town. And Mark 2, 10 through 12 then says, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Now, the sheer logic of what Jesus had just done was not lost on the teachers of the law. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus just said he forgave the man's sins. Which means he claimed to be God. And to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt the authority that he had, he would do something miraculous and prove it. I'll heal this paralyzed man known to these folks and he will get up, take his mat and go home. And he'll do it right in front of all of them. And he did. Oh my goodness. Did the crowd applaud? Did they cheer? Well, probably it says they praised God for sure. This is Jesus' first recorded use of his primary name for himself, found in the Gospel of Mark, Son of Man. That title focuses on his absolute humanity even as he proves his absolute deity over and over again. Fully man. Fully man. He walked among us willingly. He came as a baby. He grew up. He taught. He loved people like no one else ever. He had parents, brothers, and sisters, and Eventually, he allowed himself to suffer and die, the result of being brutally murdered on a cross through the efforts of the Jewish religious leaders and the Roman government. He was innocent. But he took all of our sins upon himself so that, he, that we might be reconciled to, for all eternity to our creator God. I submit his pain was unlike the pain of any other person ever. And while we remain on this earth, he has provided the Holy Spirit, this comforter. In Greek, the word is paraclete, to literally dwell within us, to guide us, to counsel us, to prevent us from ever being separated from God. Indeed, we have never seen anything like this. So we should ask ourselves, what just happened here? These four men carried their paralyzed friend to Jesus to be healed. He was healed, both spiritually and physically, and so were his four friends. They were saved to spend eternity with God in heaven because of their faith. The same amazing gift is available to us. Free. By grace. Purchased by Jesus' death on a cross and made real by his resurrection. If you're here and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior... Somewhere, sometime, someone 
probably a series of some ones over time help carry you to the king. Maybe when you were a child or a teen or even an adult. May have been a parent, a Sunday school teacher, a spouse, a pastor, a friend, just like these people that day. We have every reason to praise God. Now, here's my request. Can you think of even one person in your life who you might help to come know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Or perhaps there's someone in your life who Jesus has saved, but they've wandered away from close fellowship with him. Pray for them. Reach out and show your love for them. Indeed. Help carry them to the king. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your amazing word. Thank you for living among us and providing the only way to be reconciled with our creator God. Show us who you would have us help carry to you. Then give us the courage and the willingness to do it. May this be part of our 2020 vision for this year, 2020. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. amen. Oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Hymn number 676. We'll just sing one verse. Let's all stand, please. <laughs> God's called us this year to rethink how we see the world and we see the mission God's called us to. Amen. Today, I'm going to ask that you would come to the fellowship time. We have our annual meeting. It'll be brief, but it's going to be during that time. So everyone's welcome. Please come and be a part of that. Also, don't forget this Wednesday at 10 o'clock, we're going to be celebrating the life of Wally Sanders. It'll be in this room at 10 a.m. Please don't miss that uh, celebration memorial service I've got got the message I have one more addition I was so nervous about talking I forgot to put the time up there 1230 I even forgot to put it in the bulletin <laughs> so what we're asking is that you kind of talk to me and say yeah I think I'm gonna make it or I'm not because the restaurant I can if the, we we're going to yeah. have a big crowd, like I hope we've got to get some people in there to serve us. But <laughs> call me or call the office. Yes. If you call me, I'm not going to answer because I don't know who you are, so leave a message. God bless. <laughs> May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you.